Good morning to everyone and welcome to this uh, session. Uh, my name is Kike Basat. I am a research professor at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and I am one of the investigators of the Science for Pandemics uh, project that is currently being uh, coordinated from the Hospital San Juan de Deo in Barcelona. Um, we are going to be recording this uh, session, so please uh, turn off your cameras. Um, uh, we would like to thank all the schools that have confirmed their participation and welcome our friends in Lisboa, in Porto, in Campobasso, in Cagliari, in Schio, in Ferrara and in Campania. And um, we hope that you have been able to play with the game. And if you haven't, we encourage you to play with, with the game. Uh, but the session today has two objectives. Um, the first is to broaden the knowledge about the professional profiles involved in the management and handling of a pandemic. And you will meet some very interesting people today that will uh, help you understand a little bit more what are specific tasks related with the handling of a pandemic. And second is to resolve doubts in relation to the educational content of the game. What are the general concepts about the pandemic? What are the recommended prevention measures? What are the causes and treatments of the diseases present in the game and the professional profiles uh, involved? And, and through a question and answers section, we will try and, and provide some specific responses. Our audience today are uh, students from different schools. Uh, and as I said, the, this is going to be recorded. So we will be able to, to disseminate the contents of this video to those schools that could not connect today. But uh, our, our objectives, as I've mentioned, is, is to, to introduce you to the general concepts surrounding a, a pandemic. Um, given that I am a, a, a pediatrician and I am a, a specialist in, in tropical medicine and in epidemiology, uh, I thought I could start by introducing the general concept of, of a pandemic and what is a pandemic and, and what is the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? Or what is the difference between an outbreak, an epidemic and a pandemic? And it's just a question of size and, and spread. Uh, an outbreak is a small uh, episode which involves a few hundreds or even thousands of individuals that get infected with a, a, a given infection. An epidemic is when this outbreak becomes wider, generally typically in a, in a same geographical location. And when this infection spreads and uh, uh, ends up affecting a variety of countries is when we talk about pandemic. And it's not easy that an, an outbreak becomes a, an epidemic and it's not easy that an epidemic becomes a pandemic. And the proof is that it, it's been a very long time since we didn't have a pandemic declared officially. And the COVID-19 pandemic was the first one declared in, in many decades. Um, but that is the, the definition of, of a pandemic, uh, a generalized infection that affects many different countries and that spreads very rapidly between uh, individuals or between uh, other hosts. You can have a pandemic affecting animals, but in, in today's case, we will focus very much on, on human, uh, uh, on pandemics causing disease in, in humans. And um, one important thing is to understand what are the professional profiles. And that's the particular benefit of a session like this today is what are the particular uh, professional profiles that have to do with a pandemic? I, I guess many of you uh, listening uh, will have some interest in science and or on generally becoming involved with working around uh, outbreaks of infectious diseases or epidemics or even pandemics in the future. And for that, uh, it's obvious that there are certain professional profiles that are the ones that come to your mind when you think about a pandemic and clinicians and, and professional healthcare providers that includes nursing staff and anyone working in the health system is probably the first one that comes to everybody's mind. No? When you have a disease, you need those that deal directly with the disease, no? the clinical doctors, those that are at the emergency rooms, those that are at the intensive care rooms. Um, those that are the primary healthcare uh, that deal with the first evidence of, of, the, of that disease, uh, all the nursing staff that support the work of the clinicians that take care of the patients. These are the very obvious uh, professional profiles, but there are many others. And some of them are not so obvious, although you may have been familiar with them because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would start by saying everybody that has to do with the laboratory. Uh, if you have an infectious disease pandemic or an outbreak of any infectious disease, you need to be able to 
identify the pathogen, the micro the microbe that is actually causing that infectious disease outbreak. And for that, you normally need uh, the capacity of the laboratory to identify the, the, the pathogen. You may recall that with the COVID-19 pandemic at the beginning, there was a talk of a virus that was causing disease, but we didn't really know what this virus was. This virus didn't even have a name at that moment. It was a new virus. Uh, it, it, it was associated to other previously known virus, but it, it was known to be different from those viruses. And until somebody at the laboratory could uh, identify it more clearly and was able to sequence it, and that means uh, uh, describing exactly the, the, the characteristics of that uh, new pathogen, and, and, and classify it in the, in, in the kind of virus that that virus was, then uh, it, it took us a while until we were able to, to, to have a, an identified pathogen and to give it the name of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we didn't even have the name of the disease itself. Uh, COVID-19 was something that came out later and, and COVID-19 came later than, than the identification of the, of the virus itself. So you need the lab people, and some of the lab people are uh, microbiologists, but some of the lab people are just laboratory technicians or, or people that are virologists and that are specialists in a virus or parasitologists that are specialists in a parasite or uh, bacteriologists, whichever the new pathogen uh, is involved with. And then you also need... Um, the public health specialist and the epidemiologist. And the epidemiologist is, is a medical doctor, generally, that is uh, more concerned about what is happening at the community level than not at the individual level. So it's often been said that epidemiologists or public health specialists take care of communities and, and worry about the monitoring of what is happening at the community level and not at the individual level. And this is important. You will all remember the importance of epidemiologists and public health specialists in the pandemic because we were the ones describing what was actually happening and the trends and when we were seeing a new wave coming we were the ones that were saying there are there are peaks of transmission in this given zone or there are peaks of transmission in this given zone and and that is the beginning of a new wave or is the or is the end of of a current wave no and th this is generally the role of epidemiologists and public health specialists and on top of that Public health specialists also are the ones designed that have the role of designing the interventions to actually prevent and contain the transmission of a given disease. Finally, I would mention the industry. The industry is fundamental because the industry has the technological capacity to actually develop the new drugs that will be required to treat this uh, new pathogen, the new vaccines that will be required to prevent uh, this new uh, disease. Uh, the new diagnostic tests, there is a wide amount of uh, things that the industry uh, and the pharmaceutical industry in particular will be tasked with doing. And without the pharmaceutical industry, we would not be able to tackle a pandemic uh, if we were only relying on academia. Academia is important, but the industry has the muscle to actually produce. If you think that more than 15,000 million doses of COVID vaccine have been given all over the world in the last three and a half years, you will understand that uh, this needs the muscle of the industry to be able to produce such enormous amount of, of products. So this is just in a nutshell, uh, some of the profiles, you will find a new other profiles that are very important and I deliberately didn't mention now because we will get to know some of them through different round tables. Uh, but let's not lose more time in this general uh, uh, and initial overview and let's I'll give the word to uh, Beatriz Fiestas to introduce the first round table. Thank you very much, Kike. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Beatriz Fiestas. I'm a journalist. I'm the communications coordinator at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. We are in charge of communications of the Science for Pandemics project. Uh, so now let's start with the first round table uh, about vaccine-related health professionals. We have invited uh, three different health professionals with different um, profiles, uh, different backgrounds, to to talk a little bit about their their work, about their functions, and um, about their role during a, a pandemic. So first of all, we have Ana Mora. She's a pharmacist. She has worked for more than twenty years in the pharmaceutical company Sanofi, where she has been involved in a lot of different clinical trials. Hi, Ana. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we also have invited uh, Laura Soler. 
She has been a nurse since 2005, and she has worked at uh, San Juan de Deo Hospital for more than 15 years now. The last 12 years, she has been working in the research unit as a, a nurse coordinator of clinical trials and as a neurology group reference. Hi, Laura. Hi, hello, everyone. And then you already know Kike Basat. <laughs> as, he, as he has said, he's a ped pediatrician and an epidemiologist, and he's a researcher at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, uh, where he studies um, infectious diseases, mainly malaria and respiratory, respiratory infections, uh, among many other things. So let's start um, with the with the first question, Anna. We go with you. Um, you're a pharmacist, but yeah. you are you are not behind a counter in a pharmacy. Could you tell us what your job is? Okay. Well, as you can imagine, most of people when are when are thinking about a pharmacy, it's, uh, thinking in a person behind the counter. But for a pharmacist, there are many many opportunities to to work, and for instance, in in public institutions, in, in uh, health institutions, hospitals, research sites. But in my case, uh, after working for a, well, several months in a, in a pharmacist, uh, I, I moved to a pharma company. And, and since 20 years ago, uh, I'm working in the research department of a big uh, pharma company called Sanofi. Um, I'm the, the research department uh, is uh, the department who is in charge to discover new medicines and, and also to, to develop. Uh, and this develop uh, is developed uh, through the clinical trials. So I, I am working in the clinical research uh, department co conducting clinical trials to, to see if uh, the new entities, if the new drugs are uh, safe and, and also beneficial for, for the patients. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and Laura, you're a nurse. I'm sure that many of the uh, two kids that are with us today, they can imagine what uh, what a nurse is because we, they have been in contact with, uh, with uh, positions like yours. But tell us, why did you decide to become a nurse? What attracted you to the profession? Well, at the beginning, when I was 16, 17, uh, I wasn't sure what to do with my life. But uh, the only thing I knew is that I wanted something, a profession helping people. So I decided to train as a nurse and I finished my training as a nurse in 2005. And then I decided to move to UK to live an experience in there. And I worked there for two years. And then I came back to Barcelona and I started working here in Hospital San Juan de Deu. And then is when I realized that my, my real passion are uh, kids and uh, I specialized as a pediatric nurse, and I've been working here since 2007, which is more than 16 years now. And the last 12 years, I've been working on the clinical trials unit. Uh, we start 12 years ago. I start. I was the first one starting in here. Uh, I'm so lucky. I've been. I, I watch all the the progress of the unit. And I start in 2012, I, 2011 in this position. We had around 10 clinical trials ongoing, more or less, in that moment. And currently, we have more than 300, all in pediatrics. Later, we will ask a little bit more, more about what your functions are and what you do there. And Kike, you already said you're a pediatrician and an epidemiologist. What made you decide to work in this field? And, and also, what did you study to become that? So I... I... I studied medic medicine, uh, which takes six years in, in Spain, um, but I studied medicine because I, I knew I wanted to work in Africa and I thought that was the best way of actually ending up uh, ending up working in Africa because there's a big need for, for medical doctors. But once I disembarked in Africa and I had my first experience in Africa, my first professional experience in Africa, I very quickly understood that I needed to specialize myself and that I needed to, to further study and train. So I became a pediatrician, which is a medical doctor specialist in pediatric care. And, um, and then once I was working as a pediatrician in Africa, I also understood that if I was to become a researcher, then I could have uh, an even larger impact. And that's why I became a researcher. And I don't do clinical assistance today. I only do 100% of my time clinical research. 
but I think that is the way that I am managing to have more impact uh, in, 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 in the uh, problems related to child health. Thanks, Anna. And as a pharmacist working in the industry, what do you think are the most important skills and competencies for your profession? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it, it requires a, a, a wide uh, capabilities. No, uh, some some of them are quite obvious. For instance, uh, curiosity, uh, to eager to to learn. Uh, but this is linked uh, to to everybody who wants to to, to be a scientist. Uh, but but also to have the capability of challenge the status quo to to go uh, try to go beyond and and uh, stretching no for for things that has already been said no. Uh, uh, but also I, I think some more specific uh, capabilities. It, it could be also the the, the patience and and the, the perse perseverance because sometimes in in when you are researching and doing clinical trials, uh, the, the results uh, are is not uh, uh, as you expected. You you are in researching for a long time and then the the results uh, could be disappointing. So uh, you have to to carry on researching until you arrive. No, to to get the to achieve the the results, no, but also something important related to clinical trials and research is also to have a, an an ethics component, no, to to be to, to have in, in mind, um, and and also some something different. Uh, but it's important also that the sense of empathy with with the patients because you you need to understand what, what that are they they need and and the the burden that they they can have uh, related to uh, to their disease and something more maybe more technical technical but also important is to, to have a uh, project management skills to mm -hmm. to develop a uh, big projects uh, as a clinical trial and and also uh, let's say strategical thinking i uh, I will do a remark. Thanks. We'll have that in consideration. Um, and Laura, you you told us before that you have been working for quite a many amount of years uh, as a nurse in the research unit. Uh, mm -hmm. What does a nurse there do on a daily basis? What are your responsibilities? What do you do during your day? <laughs> it's something that people really don't know what we do in here because I have to say when you train as a nurse, is something that they don't teach you. And it's something I, I learned uh, since I started working in here. Uh, what we do here, we coordinate the clinical trials. So we are in the middle of everybody. We are in the middle of the families and the patients, the doctors, the investigators, the, phar the pharmacists and everybody. And we make sure that all the clinical trials are performed according to the protocol. We schedule all the visits and we also perform all the visits. Uh, I also do, obviously, the tasks as a nurse. Uh, I take blood, I put the catheters, the IV catheters, I administrate the medication IV. And, uh, and we have a very big team in here working together because we are so many nurses working here and we have also healthcare assistants uh, giving us support to perform all these, all these visits. Thank you. And Kike, you already explained a little bit what I, an epidemiologist, uh, what are their functions in, in your talk before, but can you explain, expand a little bit more about what uh, do epi epi epidemiologists sorry, do during a pandemic? What do you do to prevent the spread of a disease? Yes, it's... I, I think some of you may recall what actually happened during the pandemic, but but epidemiologists were the ones that were interacting very closely with with modelers, with mathematical modelers, to produce epidemiological curves of what was happening. And you remember that when we were saying, for example, we are entering the second wave or the third wave of the pandemic, it's because we were able to put the numbers together and say. In this specific place, in this specific country, we are seeing an abnormal amount of cases, of new cases, and therefore we can call this an outbreak, we can call this a wave, an epidemiological wave. And, and our role was to actually describe what was happening at the community level, not, not at the individual level. Because this allows you to target your interventions. No? If you say we have a specific problem in this particular part of the country, then you can say here we need to lock people down in their houses and not allow them to move. Or we can 
promote the use of barrier uh, measures or say we, we urgently need to vaccinate this specific uh, uh, population group because that's where the problem is actually concentrating. So that is the role of epidemiologists, to look at the problem from a community perspective, not from an individual perspective, and to be able to, pro to describe what is happening and to propose solutions to actually mm, counteract what is actually happening. Thanks. And Anna, uh, what about pharmacists during a pandemic? Uh, what is the work of a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical company such as Sanofi mm -hmm. um, uh, during why it's important during a pandemic and how does it contribute to preventing or stopping the spread of the disease? What's well, your uh, <laughs> during a pandemic, the, 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 the main uh, objective of a pharma company is, is to bring uh, new medicines to in this case to, to new diseases no? and and that implies the the, the discovery and, and the research uh, from the very beginning no? uh, to, to bring these uh, new compounds and and develop uh, to, to see if uh, as a, it's new if uh, they they are safe and, and beneficial so uh, the 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 main uh, task is is to to put in place uh, clinical trials at, at first with a, a little people to to see if the, these new drugs or vaccines uh, are are safe or uh, and beneficial and they are effective and then if the, the results are positive you you can increase the the number of people and and then and the same way you have to to monitor uh, the the results the 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 safety of these uh, people uh, and 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 then uh, well uh, the 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 main challenge at that time is is the time because uh, as uh, we usually spend uh, maybe ten years uh, seven, between seven. Years to develop a new medicine, but uh, in in the case of pandemics, we we should do it in in almost a year. So uh, mm. that that means uh, that uh, uh, be in in a hurry uh, all the time no? to to develop develop new medicines to overlap different phases of development. And and then once uh, you 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 have seen that it's safe and, and beneficial and it has been approved by the, the health authorities, you you have to produce this new uh, medicine in a in a big scale and be able to distribute to over the world. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. quite quite a big uh, effort that you have to do during a pandemic, right? I guess that mm -hmm. a lot of. Uh, People working to do that, a lot of money being put there to to make things uh, become reality. Um, and Laura, how does a nurse contribute to the management and handling of a pandemic? Well, it was a, a big challenge for well for all of us. It was a big challenge the pandemic. But well, as I said, I work on the clinical trials unit, so uh, we had a problem with the, all the patients were that they were participating on the clinical trial because they were not allowed to come to the hospital because we have so many patients living around Spain and also around Europe and even around the world. So what we tried to do uh, was to send the medication home, uh, all the medication that was oral, obviously. But for those patients who had a treatment that was intravenous or something like that, we did our best for them not to avoid the, the treatments. So uh, we went to their homes to give the treatment sometimes. Um, patients came from 1,000 kilometers away, driving every week to my hospital to get the medication. Uh, parents telling me, Laura, we can get there, but we will get there at nine o'clock at night. Okay, I'll be in the hospital for you. We'll infuse the medication at nine o'clock. So for us it was a very challenging time and we were working uh, six days a week in the hospital, it was very hard. And also in the personal situation, because I have two little kids, they were at home with his dad, and it was very difficult to handle it. But uh, we, I think we, we did our best, and all the patients received all the treatments as, 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 as far as we could. And obviously, we had to start also research on the, on the COVID-19, 
and we had some studies in the hospital that we had to contribute as well. So it was a very, very hard time for us. I'm sure that we can all agree that uh, we 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 give all the recognition uh, to nurses and clinicians and well everywhere everyone in fact because also researchers and the pharma companies for producing the 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 drugs or the vaccines in in this case but all our recognition to all the work that you did during the pandemic and um, let's continue um Kike, during a pandemic, do you have to work with other professionals to do your job as a researcher? Can you give us some example? I was actually going to say that this, this recognition, uh, which I fully echo, uh, is important. But one of the unique things that happens in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation, such as the one in a pandemic, is, is the will to collaborate. No, uh, it, it is incredible to actually look back what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic when you had clinicians, nurses, uh, uh, research professionals, the industry, uh, industrial partners that you would have never thought. I remember SEAT, the, the, the car uh, industry in Spain, producing with the with the windmill thing that you uh, use for uh, for the cars to get the the water away when it rains producing um, ventilators uh, because it was needed because we had a scarcity of ventilators so one of the of the of the positive things of the few positive things that can come out of of a situation of crisis of global crisis like we had during the pandemic was this willingness to collaborate and and unless you do it this way it will not work and we didn't have four vaccines against COVID in six months, which is an absolute record time. Uh, we wouldn't have that if we had not all collaborated in, in trying to get this. And 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 we wouldn't be today where we are, uh, where we have labeled end of pandemic, uh, if we hadn't collaborated all, all together. So I think it's 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 one, as I said, it's one of the few positive things that I take out of, of a very serious and severe situation that we all had to go through is this willingness to to collaborate and work together for a global good, which is trying mm -hmm. to sort out a, a situation of crisis. Absolutely. Uh, and Anna, uh, to the last question, um, can you give us some concrete examples of, of your work during the, the COVID-19 pandemic of, mm -hmm. uh, about which we're talking now? Yeah, no, there's something related to, to uh, what mentioned Laura and and Kike, you know, in, in a clinical trial, in a regular clinical trial, the, the, the collaboration and, and transversal collaboration and in, interaction is, is key, but it was um, more crucial during pandemics. And we, we work with investigators and healthcare professionals at sites. And maybe one of the most interesting activities is, is um, when, when in a regular trial, the, the patient came to the hospital to, to receive the medication. But uh, at that time, we tried to avoid as, as much as possible uh, the, the visits at hospital. So we organized a system to, to uh, deliver the, the medication, uh, the, the, well, uh, the investigational medication directly to the patient uh, with well, a transport system uh, that when the, the, the the medicines uh, were from the, the the hospital pharmacy until uh, to the, the patient's home, in order to to avoid patients to to come to the hospital. And and the same for for some tests that it requires to go to the hospital, we we set a, a home uh, care uh, system, a home home nursing system, to to in this case, as Laura mentioned, to to go to the patient's home to. Uh, to obtain the samples or or administrate the, the medication. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And um, Kike already mentioned some of the um, lessons or, or, or good things that we took out from the pandemic. But Laura, what lessons can we learn from the from the COVID nineteen pandemic about the work nurses had to do? Well, I think we learned that we are very strong <laughs> and we, I think we, I think not only nurses, all the, the health prof professionals, I think we adapt so quickly to the changes and we quick respond to the, 
to the needs of the people in that moment. And I think we, we did our best. While people was locked down at home, we were here working in the front of the line every day. And uh, uh, I think we we have to be proud of of our, ourselves in that time because I think we I think we did a really good job all together working as a team. I agree totally. And uh, Kike, uh, as a researcher, can you give us a concrete example of of the impact of your research work during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Yes, uh, a, a good one is that we we actually were very interested in understanding whether children um, were uh, contributing to the transmission of the virus. First, whether they could get infected in a similar way to adults. We knew that most of the infections were happening in adults at the beginning of the pandemic, but we didn't know how easy it was for a child to get infected of all ages. And the second thing is how much did they contribute to transmitting the, the virus to other people, no? and particularly those that were surrounding them in the, at the household level, because that had implications for the strategy to actually bring them back to school. You will all remember that everybody stopped going to school, and therefore it was important to understand what was the potential of transmitting the virus so we could design specific uh, interventions to prevent transmission at the school level and reopen the schools for children kids to, to benefit of going back to school. So we did study together with San Juan de Deo and with the clinical trans unit, and, and we did quite groundbreaking studies in a moment of high difficulty where it was everybody was locked down at home and it was very difficult to go to the hubs of people and actually take samples and investigate uh, whether kids that were living uh, next to somebody that had become infected were actually infected themselves or had been infected themselves, etc. But we did very good and high quality studies in, in a very difficult moment. We were able to demonstrate that kids were um, less prone to transmit infections, uh, although they could get infected in a similar rate than, than, than adults. And that helped us to design uh, a, a more evidence-based strategy for reopening schools, no? considering that children could be infected, but were less good at transmitting the infection to, to others. And the work that we actually did together with San Juan de Deo and together with many other partners uh, was actually instrumental for the Spanish government to decide to, to reopen schools as early as September 2020, when most of the schools in other places in the world were still closed, and to maintain schools open, even in the, in the midst of the second wave, the third wave, the fourth wave, uh, when other countries were reclosing again the, the schools and we trusted the science and the science mm -hmm. was telling us that it was safe to reopen the schools and it was safe to do it, it provided we were following some basic uh, recommendations. Thank you. Very, very interesting that the government decided to follow the science, no? uh, the, the evidence, the scientific evidence for their policies. So thank you very much uh, to the three of you, Anna, Laura and Kike, for your time. Uh, I think it's been a really interesting uh, round table and now we will move on to a second one and I will give the floor back to Kike who will be in charge of moderating this second uh, round table. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. And, and I think it's a moment now to move to other professions that are very important in, in the middle of a pandemic and we haven't we've only slightly mentioned so so far no and i have the pleasure of introducing you three people that will be in this round table one of them is bea that you've already met uh, beatriz fiesta is a journalist a communications coordinator at is global at the barcelona institute for, for global health and and is a particular journalist which has interest in science and and that is that is a specificity of of, of journalists not all journalists are good at transmitting science the second person is dr monse Esquerda. And Monse is the director of the Institute Borja de Bioética. Uh, so he's related with everything that has to do with ethics. And ethics is a fundamental topic that everybody should have in mind when we are discussing about science and specifically about conducting science in the middle of a public health emergency, uh, because it's not the same as conducting science in a normal uh, life situation. And finally, but not less important, is uh, Alex Alexandre Parera, uh, who has a degree in physics and electrical engineering, but who is uh, importantly a data analyst. And uh, uh, as a data analyst, it is fundamental that he will share with, with us uh, how do you actually make sense of all the data that 
are being generated in the middle of a, of a public health emergency and how you can utilize those data to actually inform of what's happening no? and how you can feed those, those data for the greater good. So I have the pleasure of having this fantastic uh, uh, panel of, of uh, non-clinical professionals, but that played a significant uh, role uh, in um, in uh, in the pandemic. And uh, so maybe the first thing we need to to actually uh, do is is to ask how they would describe uh, themselves. No, and I will start by by asking Monse, uh, what is your background and and where do you currently work? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm sorry, but I'm a physician, but I work sorry, in sorry. various things. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm two pediatrician working with men, children's mental health, but I'm here because I also work as a bioethicist. And bioethicist is very, very interesting field. And there is a lot of backgrounds there. M my colleagues, for example, I work with a philosopher and a lawyer, sociologist or psychologist. So it's possible to work in a pandemic being a philosopher or also a sociologist because bioethics is a really multi multidisciplinary field. Thank you, Monse, and forgive me for omitting that you're a pediatrician, of course, a very important medical profession. Uh, but but the focus in this discussion today is your bioethical hat. So thank you for that introduction. Let me ask uh, Alex uh, the same question. What is your background and, and where do you currently work? Good. Thank you very much, Kike, for your kind introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a physicist, as you said, and I studied um, um data science for most of my career um i worked for several years in the usa in um in data science in power electric uh, devices uh, which is essentially a power distribution and then i had the opportunity to co come back to spain uh launching a new research line on uh, using data science in health which was quite innovative at that time so this is what they did, and 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 in, at that time, big data it was not a word, you know, and but essentially we do uh, big data in with clinical um, data sets and clinical information. So that's essentially what we do. Thank you, thank you, Alex, and Bea. The same questions for you. What is your background? I've already described, it, but put it mm -hmm. in your own words. And 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 where do you currently work? Um, well, I'm a journalist, as uh, you all know. Um, actually, I studied uh, humanities uh, with a focus on literature. And after that, I studied my degree in journalism. Uh, and since I love uh, studying and learning, uh, I also went for a master's degree in, in international affairs. Um, during my my experience, I, I, I have worked in a newspaper, I have collaborated with different magazines and blogs and radios, and then I started working as a communications officer, uh, first for several NGOs, and more than 10 years ago, I, I got into the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, uh, where I started communicating science, um, first as, as a press officer and now as a communications coordinator. And actually, mainly what we do um, uh, in, in the communications department is we translate complex scientific findings um, into accessible stories. So uh, we try to translate the evidence that the researchers find and that they publish in scientific journals with um, complicated words and graphs and everything, we try to, to make it, it uh, we convert it into something that everyone can understand, like my mother uh, and all of you can understand. That's when, when we do uh, correctly things. <laughs> and how we do that, we do that through different um, materials through press releases, articles, through videos and other channels. Sometimes we use infographics, uh, we even uh, use comics to, to translate this scientific information. Uh, we, we choose the, the best channel and the best material to get to, the, to, the, to, to our audience, we would say, no? to, to all of you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bea. So um, I'm starting a set of new questions for all of you, and and I will uh, start with with Monse again. Uh, how would you describe your functions with your ethical uh, hat? And and I'm interested in understanding competences. And what what would you say are you, the three most important competences that that a professional in bioethics uh, should should have? Mm -hmm. So, uh, pandemics present multiple challenges, a lot of them. We have experienced it in COVID-19, and many of these challenges are technical, are scientific ones. For example, developing an effective vaccine, an effective treatment, or a therapy. But a lot of these challenges are not exactly uh, technical or scientific. And there was the most defiant and controversial challenges. And they are about what what's right to do. What's the best thing to do in a lot, a lot of, of questions. For example, if a treatment is scarce, if there's not a lot of treatment enough for treat everybody, who's going to benefit it? And it's an ethical question, not just a technical question. Or how to allocate a scarce vaccine. If there are few vaccines or a few treatment, who should uh, access first to it? The youngest or the oldest one? The most serious ill people or who mm, could have more benefit for it? Or for example, a vaccine may be mandatory or just mandatory for healthcare professional. There's a lot of questions. Or for example, Laura commented about the difficult to access to a proper treatment for a lot of children. So um, how about to, is it right to restrict travel or the lockdown? There's a lot, a lot of questions that the right decision in these cases is not a technical matter. It's not resolved just with science. So requires value judgment. Judgment. Yeah. So, how, how, what's the competence to do that? I think it's really a, a difficult question. But first, I think it's really important to have the competence to listen a lot of different people. The greater the number of people we incorporate into a debate, also in a collaboration field, it's more possible to, to get uh, better solutions. Second, the ability or the competence to deliberate, to be able to listen each other's and um, at the end to accord something. Maybe not the perfect solution, but uh, the, the better solution in this, in this situation. And also a, a biotesis must have to properly order all the values that are in conflict. I think it's so. Thank you, Monsen. Let me ask you following this, eh? sorry that I, I keep asking you, but I think it follows very well. How much were you listened to? Uh, did people <laughs> listen to what you were saying and how satisfied are you of your contribution in terms of your recommendations being followed and listened? To? And I know I it's a difficult question. Uh, I always say that uh, it's necessary more science to, to resolve a pandemic, but also mm, more ethics. Because I think we have uh, incorporated more ethics in the COVID-19, sometimes uh, we have uh, had better results, not just science. For example, with uh, the restriction to the schools, the lockdown and the impact in the children's mental health we are living now. So I think we didn't list. Uh, listen it to people during COVID-19, but for the future, it must be required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monse, for these insights. Alex, uh, same questions to you, but I will combine it in a single question. What do you think are the, the most important competences in your work? And and why is a professional profile like yours important in the management and handling of a, of a pandemic? Yeah. You could give us a little bit of your, your experience. Yeah, it's a it's a complex uh, uh, question, uh, but uh, data science it's the science of information, and maybe one of the most delicate things that we suffered in the past pandemics is this lack of good information. Uh, everybody had fear, and it's it's interesting 
how this perception of what is happening, it's different from what the data is telling you. So the first skill I would say is it's maths. Maths, it's the first tool we have to look at the reality from the, our most objective way. Um, so maths, it's a way to look at what's happening and then to take decisions from what maths are saying. And these decisions are not based on fear or our perception are based on evidence that we get. And maybe the, the second skill is teamwork. And that's very difficult with people from my discipline. Uh, you know, some people, they have a very, I don't know, self-esteem or however you want to call it, and they fight. So it's it's difficult to make them work in team. Um, I think that's maybe one of the, I would say it's the second best skill that we we should have, right? To be able to listen to what other people are saying and to consider that they have another perspective that maybe it's further than, than your own. And the third, which is closely related to the second one, it's communications. And it's it's very really hard for people with a maths background to have very good communication skills. Uh, but it's a must because uh, all your work with your maths and all your effort, it's useless if you cannot communicate them in a proper way and in a convincing way. And um, you, you might be seeing something which is very relevant and it's truth, but if you are not capable of communicating it, then it's really a problem. And, and maybe, maybe that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, because that, that allows me very nicely to, to go to Bea and say, how do you, how do you digest very difficult to, to communicate information, as Alex was saying, in a way that your mother could understand, no? as you mentioned before, the example, no, and anyone that can read can, can feel that they are participating of that information sharing and, and understanding it, you know, and, and, and knowing how how to uh, interpret better and 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 in addition to that and in addition to the competences that that a, a job like yours has how do we fight against the fake news which are the another big problem of our current society and that we've seen so badly um, infecting the the overall uh, uh, scene during the pandemic and where we we had to to do extra efforts to to fight against yeah absolutely um, I would say that um, one of the first competencies uh, that a journalist uh, needs, um, I would say it's uh, to have research skills, uh, which means um, not only uh, liking to learn, but to understand uh, things, right? So we can, we can say that journalists are a little bit like detectives. Uh, you need to be good at searching for information uh, and not get just the first document, but looking to a variety of documents, talking to different people, getting the, all the sides uh, of the equation uh, and making sure that you have all the right facts before you, you tell a story. Uh, so it's not just you get a, a, a paper and then you you mm, you write the story about it, but you really understand it talk to the people involved, see if there are other sides. So uh, these research skills are, are important. Then obviously you need communication skills because you have to tell the story. No, You have to tell the story to lots of people. So we need to be good at using words to explain things in a way that everyone can understand. And this means writing well uh, or speaking clearly uh, and uh, just uh, making sure that uh, your audience gets what you are trying to understand. The clue is that you understand it yourself, what you're trying to explain. Once if you fully understand it, then uh, it's it's a, a kind of different uh, grades that you, you can explain it, right? Um, and then it's uh, also very important to be honest and to avoid bias. Uh, and honesty means telling the truth. In journalism, this is super important because people uh, rely on you to give them accurate information. And that's why it's very important to double check the information, to avoid fake news, as you said. 
uh, it's very important that you don't um, uh, rely on what you get. You double check things again, as I already said, you talk to different people from different sites uh, so that you get different versions and you fully understand what you are uh, reading or what you have in your hands so that you can explain it in an accurate way. Um, and make sure that there, you, you have the right facts uh, before you, you write a story, right? Um, and as I said, it's also very important that uh, you avoid BS. BS is when you, you like one thing more than another. And, and then it affects your decisions. No, journalists uh, should be neutral. It's not always like that <laughs> nowadays, but uh, that's like super important. Journalists should be neutral, not take sides and not let their personal feelings influence their, their stories. And uh, as I said, uh, understand it um, really well. Talk to a lot of people, um, double check the information, uh, and not take sides, I would say. So those are like the, the, the important competences to, 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 to be able to communicate uh, the, the information. Thank and you, Bea. That, that, that's very important because uh, one thing is a professional journalist and another thing is a professional opinionated person, no? or person with an opinion. And in this era of uh, people with strong opinions and, and uh, of influencers that may not have the professional background to actually do the job as they should be doing, like like Bear was describing, as journalists should be doing, verification of 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 what is being told is it becomes very important. But I will ask the three of you and and openly and feel free to, to respond. How do we do that? How do we verify information when in the middle of a pandemic we are having hundreds of papers, scientific papers published every day, when some of those papers actually have to be revoked by the scientific journal because it's been proven that they contain incorrect facts. No, uh, In a normal process of, of science, uh, you send your paper to publication and this paper is reviewed by two, three or more reviewers which are independent. Uh, and and guarantee the quality of the work and the and verify the quality of the work somehow and and give it the seal of quality that this is a peer reviewed publication in the middle of the pandemic sometimes we don't have time for that no and and we've seen examples of of information that has been published and that has been found not to be accurate and that has required being revoked no so how how do we do this in the middle of the crisis that uh, allow, doesn't allow us to do our job with, with the same quality and the same time that, that one should uh, require? I think that's that, that's a challenge. That's a big challenge and everyone has its own responsibility. As you said, uh, researchers should try to double check uh, the papers that they get uh, and also uh, journalists with the information that they receive or the press releases and everything. Um, but it's also very important, uh, in my opinion, to recognize your mistakes. Uh, once a journal or a journalist uh, have um, disseminated a wrong information, it's important that uh, we or they uh, recognize that and, and then correct that information so that everyone is aware of that and do it in with the same uh, um, with the same strong position that they did uh, with the first notice or with the first article uh, so that everyone is aware and that everyone has this alert thing on it saying don't don't believe everything that you see especially nowadays with uh, in artificial intelligence that makes things can make uh, make things a little bit uh, more difficult to 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 see if they are uh, uh, disseminating some some fake news but don't believe everything that you that you see especially in social media that's a, a place where it's very easy to disseminate fake information and double check always double check uh, the information and verify the 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 source the first source of the information that you're getting. I, I would say that this is part of the nature of a scientist, no? that you are skeptic to results until you can verify by yourself what you are reading and the methods that have been used to reach those, those results. So I, I think there is a scientific method that people can follow. 
Um, but in the middle of a public health emergency, the scientific method sometimes has not been followed with the same uh, degree of of robustness. No, and and I will ask Monse, do you think or what do you think are the ethical connotations of 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 these fake news and of these uh, journals publishing data that have not been verified and that have required uh, um, um, apologizing and saying uh, uh, sorry, this 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 is not true. I think that it's important also to learn to navigate uncertainty. We always know or want to to uh, work with certain things and with things that uh, are fixed and it's not real at life, not also in the pandemics, but also at life. So I think it's important to be able to split what's a, a, a result or a, a news or something provisional results, it's different, not belief in science and not belief in a particular uh, result. And it's really important to do this, this split, this differentiation, because there's a method for science. And it's important to trust in this method, but other results are just uh, provisionals. So it's important to learn to do this exercise to separate both of some of the res the provisional results may, may be false, but not the method, not the science, not the main field. Thank you. And and, and following a little bit on that, uh, uh, Alex, you, you know that when you're handling enormous amounts of, of data, it's sometimes easy to choose uh, the, the specific uh, piece of the analysis that you want to show and hide the rest of, of the analysis that may, in a way, counter, contradict what, what that headline uh, piece of information you are using. No? So how, how can we ensure, in, and particularly in this new era of artificial intelligence where Bear was alluding to, where, where, where the 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 methods facilitate the, the the enormous amount of analysis of huge amounts of data but uh, how do you, how do we actually remain scientifically strong and 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 show exactly what our analyses are telling us and not only the the specific part that is more convenient to show yeah that's a very good question um, but let me go back to maths. Maths, it's the tool for everything. And also one of the values in maths research is transparency. So whenever you achieve a result, you publish the result and how did you reach to that. In AI, it's actually maths at the end of the day. Um, um, it's a part of uh, mathematics and you can also have transparency in the way AI works. And this is maybe one of the first um, yeah, tools we have to ensure that an AI or an, any uh, statistical analysis is actually producing um, um, a result which is related with truth, uh, which is transparency. There is one thing that we call reproducible research in which we do not only publish the results from our data, but we also do publish the data and how we reach the results. This means, you know, code, mathematics developments, and everything. This transparency is actually critical for trust, for building trust on AI and on everything. We have seen lots of, and we will see even um, more media uh, noise related to AI. But these AI models that the media is talking about, they do what they have been teached, you know? So they have learned to throw plausible text. But plausible text, it's not related with truth. It's related with plausibility. So we need to understand that this AI, it's not actually built to provide truth. It's built to provide plausibility conversation. And maybe this is something that we need to learn on how to use these tools, right? Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. I think this has been a very interesting round table. Uh, the importance here is to highlight that, like you, there are many uh, professional positions that are very important also uh, during a pandemic. We haven't mentioned politicians, for example, which is another very important 
uh, um, um, profession that that played a massive role during the pandemics and many of the decisions remember were taken by politicians and not by technicians on on whichever topic no but that that will be for another discussion um i i think we can um start wrapping up the the this this session but before closing this session we've received some of the questions and allow me to share share my my screen um because um we've received from from some of the the schools uh, questions let me see and I just wanted to double check that you are actually seeing the the screen and I can put it in full screen mode. Can you see it? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. So I, I'm just going to go through some of the questions and, and I'm not going to have time to answer all of those questions, but I, I think it's worth exploring some some questions that were posed uh, by some of you uh, in from the classes uh, because it translates some of the doubts that that people have no and and also some of the doubts that may have arisen since since some of you may have been playing our game um one of the questions is what is more dangerous uh, whether a disease that has a very high mortality rate or a disease that is transmitted very quickly and and I'll give you a couple of examples to 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 give you an idea on 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 how that does that work and the the question is not easy to answer eh? but i'll give you one example of a disease uh, that has pandemic potential that is has a very high mortality rate and that, that is ebola and you will all remember the ebola some of you may remember the ebola epidemic that we saw in three countries in in western africa back in 2014 in, in liberia sierra leone and guinea um, and Ebola is a is a, is a virus uh, transmitted by by a virus uh, can kill you in about fifty percent of the of the times that uh, when you catch it the, the case fatality rate of Ebola is approaches fifty percent which means that one out of two patients will end up dying. This is one example of a disease with very high mortality rate, and and um, and and another example of a disease which doesn't have a very high mortality rate but is transmitted very quickly is COVID uh, and it's SARS-CoV-2, the virus that transmits COVID. And at the beginning, uh, COVID had a higher case fatality rate uh, and, and a lower transmissibility. And during the evolution of the virus and how the virus evolved and changed the different variants and subvariants that it uh, changed, it became more and more transmissible and less and less pathogenic, which means that it, 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 it carried less severe disease. No? And if we think about uh, natural evolution, um, uh, the, the, for a virus, it is better that it becomes more infectious because it can be more easily transmitted from one individual to the next, that it causes very severe disease. Because if a virus kills you, uh, that possibly will make it more difficult for the virus to transmit to the next person. No? If, if you die and you are buried, it's more complicated that you actually transmit to the next person. <laughs> So from an evolutionary point of view, uh, for a virus, it's more convenient that it's more transmissible, even if that re uh, implies that it, it is less uh, contagious. No, it is less. Um, it causes less uh, severe disease. So we saw, if we look at it from the macro perspective, uh, the Ebola uh, pandemic was more quickly managed and it, it was more easily stopped because it was so killing it was killing so much uh, and it was therefore easier to recognize easier to isolate and easier to contain than a virus that can travel very easily in a plane and cause very little disease and in many cases be asymptomatic but therefore can spread uh, even at the global level more more simply so even though at the individual level i would always prefer a virus that has little potential to kill you from a uh, epidemiological point of view, from a public health point of view, I, I think I, I prefer a virus that causes more severe disease but finds it more difficult to spread because then my measures to prevent that spread uh, are probably going to be easier. And some other questions, I, again, I will not answer all of the questions, but uh, how do professionals protect themselves from an infectious disease? Uh, there are many levels of, of protection and it also depends very much on the mechanism of transmission, some diseases are transmitted through uh, the respiratory uh, drops uh, or, or airborne transmission through the air. 
uh, some diseases are transmitted by uh, by products that you excrete when uh, when you go to the toilet and and therefore uh, the mechanisms are maybe very different some diseases are transmitted through vectors through insects no for example through mosquitoes so you will actually protect uh, yourself and protect others with different mechanisms um, Normally, hygiene and, and cleaning of hands, etc., it, it's always among the top one measures that you put in place, particularly if you don't know how a virus is or a pathogen is transmitted. Once you understand the mechanisms of transmission, you will actually need to protect yourself, either protecting uh, uh, you from breathing in and out uh, the possible pathogen and remember the use of, of masks, the social distancing, trying to be more than a meter and a half away from the other people, not being uh, in crowded spaces with other people, allowing ventilation, etc. So some all of, of those preventive measures have to do with the transmission mechanism. And for diseases that are transmitted by insects or by mosquitoes, for example, then you protect yourself from being bitten from a mosquito or you protect yourself by uh, trying to avoid that uh, mosquito larvae actually breed in, in, in the waters or in other places, so you you can actually uh, interrupt the the transmission. At the beginning of a pandemic, remember uh, we don't know much about what is going on, so you need to apply the most stringent preventive measures. And remember in Ebola how you had to dress up with this highly protective equipment because uh, particularly Ebola is a super uh, uh, dangerous disease if you catch it so you, you need to be sure that you would not catch it and at the beginning of COVID we also were using those kind of, of, of protective equipments which uh, we ended up understanding that they were not uh, required no? so these are just in a nutshell ways of, of protecting ourselves as health professionals and protecting others from catching the diseases Another question related to uh, whether the Black Death, uh, the Black Plague, uh, was uh, worse than COVID-19. And, and if you look at the numbers, of course it was. And, and the Black Death, also you need to understand the context where it happened. No, If we had a, an epidemic of, of of the plague, which is the, the disease, the bacteria causing uh, the plague, today we have antibiotics, so we could stop the spread of that infection very quickly. But if you are thinking of the medieval times where the antibiotics did not exist, then it was impossible or virtually impossible to, to contain the spread of a disease that had a very high case fatality rates if you didn't have the antibiotics to, to treat it. No? So in terms of numbers, the Black Death uh, is said to have caused about 50 million deaths, but that was about a third of the world's population at the time. And, and it's very different from COVID, which is thought to have caused around 20 million deaths, counting the direct and the indirect uh, deaths. Um, even if we had the best available technologies uh, and, and, and very quickly, within six months, we had vaccines even to prevent it, 20 million deaths today is a small proportion of our world's population. But imagine what would have happened with a disease like COVID-19 back in the medieval times if we hadn't had uh, the technology that we have used to contain it. No? So put together, they're pretty bad, both of them. The context is what all matters no? and what makes a difference. And um, other questions, I kind of answer the following question. So I will jump into the HIV question. How can HIV be prevented? And HIV is, 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 is the other pandemic that is going on. And it's a silent pandemic because people don't talk too much about it. And because it affects mainly now, uh, and, it, and it still kills mostly those people that do not have access to uh, antiretroviral treatments, which are the treatments that you use to actually contain the, the, the infection within uh, some individual. No, um, AIDS is, is highly problematic today in most places in Africa where, where access to the antiretroviral life-saving treatments are not easy to, to to guarantee. And that's where most of the AIDS-related mortality is still occurring. In in high-income countries, in Europe and North America, etc., most people that have AIDS or that have become infected with HIV actually have access to uh, the medicines to, to, to treat it. And therefore, this becomes a chronic infection and, and doesn't have this, it doesn't become a life-threatening problem in the same way that it, it does when you don't have access to treatment. Of course, there are preventive measures that you can use. You all know how HIV is transmitted. You know that uh, you need to have protected sex if you're having uh, sex with somebody that has uh, is HIV infected. 
and condoms will will be the perfect barrier for the transmission of the of the virus um but um and there are other strategies to contain the transmission you need to screen the blood before doing blood transfusion many of the hiv cases that we had in the 1980s were due to contaminated blood transfusions we now know that blood transfusions are are routinely screened for hiv and for many other diseases like uh, syphilis like hepatitis etc so that you know that when you are receiving a blood product you are uh, it, it is sure that you will not be receiving a contaminated one no but there are many many ways of, of preventing some of those uh, infections um, and and for that you need lots of communication no because if you know how a pathogen is transmitted you know how you could actually prevent yourself from from getting it and um how do a pandemics start? This is a big, big question, not easy to on, to answer. We don't even know yet very well how the, the COVID-19 pandemic started. But in many cases, and with the experience of other infections, we know that uh, diseases that affect animals can sometimes jump from animals to humans. And this is not always the case. A, a virus that infects a, a bat, for example, or a rat, for example, doesn't necessarily cause disease in humans. Uh, or, or, and, and, and this jump from animal to human is sometimes uh, what we call a zoonotic spill and, and what can trigger the beginning of a highly transmissible new infection. No? And this is what we speculate happened with, with COVID-19. No? And, and we, we don't know for certain how it happened, but we suspect that uh, animals uh, that uh, were taken for the, for the forests uh, near Wuhan actually were taken to markets and eaten by humans and uh, and therefore humans became infected with those animals and suddenly the, the the virus that those animals were carrying were capable of causing disease in in, in humans no and and then we had human to human infection that started and that was the beginning of the of the pandemic not all pandemics start the same way not all mechanisms are the same but typically this is this is what has been described for many other pathogens and that what typically happens for for pandemics that re rely on viruses for their transmission. And finally, and I think I will stop with this uh, question uh, uh, because I think we're running out of time. Is the, what role and responsibilities do politicians have during a pandemic? And I I want to to close with this question because I think it's it's a profession that we didn't have well represented um, in our in our um, in our debate today. Uh, but politicians play a massive role and you are all very much aware of what actually happened with some politicians in the world. And I don't need to mention names of politicians, but I, we all have present that some politicians acted in a very populist way and therefore trigger uh, or put in motion decisions that ended up having negative repercussions in their populations. And, and, um, and often there is not a right or wrong uh, answer for many debates. Uh, at least until science can actually provide answers. No? And for example, we have the examples of some drugs that were proposed to, to potentially work against COVID. And that um, even though scientists did the clinical trials necessary to actually prove whether they worked or they did not work, uh, some politicians did not listen to those results and did not listen to that science. No? And we have examples in countries like Brazil, uh, in countries like the United States, uh, where uh, politicians pushed some drugs or pushed some information that were not scientifically solid enough and that or that had been even dis disproved. And even though we had good scientific information about th those products uh, and that th those products should not have been used, they were still promoted. No, um, uh, so politicians have a role and have a, a very important moral role and also have the role of listening to those that have the technical skills and the technical knowledge and the scientific background to be able to in, uh, to to guide them in their in their decisions no in our country here in spain for example we had big debates about reopening for example bars and restaurants in the middle of the pandemic and and i remember how unpleasant it was having to fight with professionals from restaurants and from bars that were really eager to reopen because their economic sustainability depended on reopening. And our scientists were telling them it's not yet the time to open because if you open, you, you can contribute to transmission. No? And sometimes politicians took the decision 
on our behalf, no? And 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 it's, it's their role. They have they are the ones that actually have to take the decisions. But sometimes they were listening to the scientists, and sometimes they were not listening to the scientists. And and I think one of the other good aspects of the of the pandemic is that we leave the pandemic with the impression that scientists are being heard and have a voice and have uh, um, uh, have an audience, even within those that have to take uh, decisions. No, and 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 the interaction between the technical experts and the politicians that have to take the responsibility of taking decisions and remember taking decisions entails a great responsibility it's a it's a gr- good uh, responsibility but it's uh, your decisions if you if you are not careful enough may may cause harm or rather than benefit but the 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 take home message that i live with during this pandemic is that uh, technical experts were were listened and um, and and there was much greater communication between experts and and not technical experts and that i think overall is a positive outcome of of the pandemic so i think i'll i'll leave it here um forgive me because i forgot to to um to show the qr uh, code that um that you need to to use i think we will we will ask you to 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 qualify how this session were, went and whether you you actually uh, enjoyed it, and please use this this QR uh, code um, uh, to to actually express your your opinion about about this event. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you thought it was useful. And uh, again, let, let us thank our our friends in in Portugal, our friends in Italy that were listening to us. And let's hope that this session can be shared among all of you and among any other schools that are interested in listening. And please play our game. You will enjoy it. Keep us sending us your opinions, your questions, and uh, let us multiply the the impact of, of, of the dissemination of science, and particularly science for pandemics, because I think it's, it's the first step for making all of you uh, more literate and more knowledgeable about uh, what a pandemic entails and how we can best together fight against future pandemics. Thank you very much.